Amen. Today I want to introduce a new series called that leads us up to Easter, that is, and it's called Tip of the Spear. Tip of the Spear. In military operations, the first soldiers to go into a war zone are called the tip of the spear. In new endeavors, new adventures, the explorers that go in first are the tip of the spear. They're just the beginning. And the tip of the spear is that pointy spot that penetrates so that the rest of it can begin to go in. And for the next few moments, I'm going to give you more of a history lesson, kind of a brief history of our world based upon a biblical worldview. So hang tight, hang with me. If you're if you're tired, if you're not paying attention, I want you to just intentionally choose right now. If you need to breathe deep, whatever it takes, you're going to hear some things that you just need to ingest and and it'll make sense as we get through it. So let's start with Adam and Eve. That's the beginning, right? Adam and Eve were the tip of the spear for humankind. They were the beginning. They were also the tip of the spear for sin. About 130 years after Adam and Eve's sin and all of that, Cain and Abel, Cain was the tip of the spear. You remember the story? Cain killed Abel. He was the tip of the spear for murder. The first murder that took place. And after Cain murdered Abel, God was uninvolved for about 1,500 years. We don't read of any kind of involvement between that time and and, and for about 1,500 years. And during that time, the population of humankind grew tremendously. There was no uh, contraception. People were living for over 900 years. Can you imagine living over 900 years? I'm 50 and I'm already starting to feel entropy. You know what I'm saying? 900 years. I can't imagine what my joints would feel like at that. So these people... During that period of time of about 1,500 years, there was, there was probably about 4 billion people on the planet. And humankind became so corrupt. There was rioting, killing, and no order. We can imagine that, can't we? There was no kind of order whatsoever. And the scripture says in Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 through 6, the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth. And that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth and his heart was deeply troubled. That's how bad things had gotten on planet earth. That's pretty bad. God regretted creating us. So the flood, you all know the story of the flood, Noah's flood back in uh, 2348 B.C., So sparing Noah and his family, God flooded the earth. And when Noah and his family disembarked the ark, they were the tip of the spear for humankind again. God giving humanity another go at it. Their job was to replenish the earth at that time. You see, God made a covenant as they came off of the ark. God said, look... I promise I will never flood the earth again. In other words, I promise I will be involved enough that I will not let it get to the place where we need to flood the earth again. So after the flood then, God made that promise and he said, I'm going to be more involved. I'm going to be a part of this and this is not going to happen again. Well, about 100 to 300 years later, the things started going south again before God had to, it was about 100 to 300 years before God had to intervene again. And with somewhere around 10,000 people on planet Earth at that time, the people were already beginning to cause trouble just like they had before the flood. Only there were a lot more people back then. God was going to keep his promise to be involved, to not let humankind get to a place where he would need to destroy us all again. So this brings us to the Tower of Babel. Now, We know from biblical history, from archaeology, and from ancient writings that it is from this area where the Tower of Babel is, that it is from this area that planet Earth, uh, of planet Earth, that mankind originated into modern times. And about 4,200 years ago, 
2200 BC, God looked down and he saw something the humans were doing. And he said, wow, we got to deal with that. So let me read it to you. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we we will be scattered over the face of the earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. I, I love that scripture. The Lord came down to see the city. And the tower the, uh, the people were building. The Lord said, if as, as one people speaking the same language they've begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth and they stopped building the city. That is why it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the earth. So we could spend a lot of time today talking about the facts, about base languages and looking back and being able to see that this story really happened. We could take time to actually show you on the map where this is, the satellite images of probably where the Tower of Babel was, but where Babylon is, and all that is still there to this very day. It's absolutely fascinating. We could take time to show you that the differences between humans like us and the Chinese is nothing more than just DNA. There is no such thing as different races. It's a human race. We're all the same. Guess what? what? You're the product of your parents' DNA. That's all it is. There are no different races. We are the human race. We could spend time going through all of that, but here's the point. These 10,000 people that were at the Tower of Babel that were dispersed based upon family and languages, they were the tip of the spear for all the divisions that we have in our world to this very day. Division brought competition. Competition is good. You see, God did this to spare humankind. And competition brought, it meant that when one group did better, when one group excelled, the other groups looked and said, oh, I think we want to be better. I think we want to excel. So it brought competition and it spared humankind at some level. Division limits collaboration. God said, man, what these people can do together with one language, we've got to slow that down because it became a problem in the past. Let's stop it now. Division created more protection. Instead of it being one big group, division created a number of groups of people protecting their own kind, and it brought some protection to them. So by doing this, the division of humanity at Babel, God made a way for humanity to survive until his plan of salvation salvation would be executed through Jesus. Are you following me? All right, so this is, this is the foundation of it. You see all of the different tips of the spear that we have as we go throughout Scripture. Some are good and some are bad. Some are awesome and some really brought trouble to us. So almost 2,000 years after creation, God had flooded the earth, and not long after that, he divided humanity into their own territories by family and languages, all right? So that's almost about 2,000 years, a little bit less than that, somewhere in that area. Now, for the next 2,000 years, we see God working through a specific group of people that were born by the father Abraham. You all have heard of Abraham, right? God promised through this man that he would have a great nation. And that nation's still here today, the Israelites. So let's read it. The Lord had said to Abraham, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will whoever curses you I will curse and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him. So Abram somewhere around 1950 to 2000 BC. That's when he was born. He was the tip of the spear. He was the tip of the spear for the nation known as Israel. 
Now, it was through the movements of Abraham's people for those 2,000 years that protected and that policed the earth. God keeping humanity from getting to the point where he would need to flood the earth again, which he promised he wouldn't. God had promised he would never flood the earth again, so it was important for him to be involved, and he chose a group of people to do that with. And better than that, it was through these people, the Jewish nation, that God would bring the Messiah into the world. Now, it seems that about every 2,000 years, we have some serious interaction between God and planet Earth. God intervenes in a big way. So the flood, Babel, Abraham, then we have the Israelites, and then what happened after those 2,000 years? Jesus shows up. Jesus pierced his way into this world, but he was only the tip of the spear for what God was really about to do. Jesus was just that tip of the spear for what God really wanted to do to penetrate into the hearts of humanity. And here we are about 2,000 years after Jesus now. And let me ask you a question. Are we blind and deaf or are we really beginning to see what God might be doing in our day and age? Is it just me or does it look like some things are going on? Over the last year, we've had what? We've had an extreme situation with our health. We've had extreme situations with our politics. And just recently, I don't know about you, but I I saw an extreme situation with our weather. And I'm not prophesying here, but I have a feeling that we're probably about to see an extreme situation Somehow with religion. Because I think it's time for some transformation to begin. Jesus was the tip of the spear for God being intimately active in our world. That's what he wants. Not just to be intimately active in our world, but to be intimately active in people's lives. And that's how he does it. You see, it wasn't just about Jesus. It was about what would happen after Jesus. So, recap. First 1,500 years to almost 2,000 years, we have God kind of hands off, and the world became so bad that during that period of time, God had to flood it. Then we have the Tower of Babel, and God divides everybody by language and family. And, and, and then we have Abraham is born, and for those 2,000 years, we have God's interaction with humankind. And so we have seen the extreme of what it looks like with God not being involved in our earth. Then we have seen his involvement for those 2,000 thousand years and so the question is where's God been for the last two thousand years because the Jews haven't been doing anything but been scattered until the 1940s where's God been You know, how could we make it for 300 years without some serious involvement with God? How can we go 1,500 years without some serious involvement with God? During that period of time, the Jews have been everywhere. It's not been, they've not been policing there. How did God get something done for us to make it another 2,000 years without? How have we done that? Well, here it is. Because Jesus was the tip of the spear for something new on earth. We had the flood, people were saved by the ark. We had division, people were divided by language. Then we had Abraham and Israel, humanity was policed by a nation. Now we have Jesus became the ark. And after Jesus, the Holy Spirit united people by language. Instead of dividing us by language, he brought us together. And I'll show you that in a minute. Then we had, instead of Abraham and Israel, we have Jesus And the church, you and me, the body of Christ. God's activity in the last 2,000 years has been through his people. Not a nation. It's bigger than that. It's the church. It's you and me uniting together. It's a worldwide body of believers who live for Him, who worship Him, who love Him, who serve Him, who live for Him and will die for Him. That's who we are. Jesus 
Jesus was, now let's, let's talk about it real quick. Jesus was crucified over Passover on the Day of Atonement. And for hundreds of years, the Israelites had been celebrating a, a, a day that comes 50 days after that. And it's called the Feast of Harvest. And you've also heard it called the Day of Pentecost. Penta meaning 50. So 50 days after Passover. So get the picture here. Jesus comes back from the dead. And he's seen more than, by more than 600 people. He pops in and out and he's giving instructions and he's kind of tidying things up in his mission and what he wants to accomplish in our lives as his believers, as his followers. And Jesus had, to say to his, had said to his disciples the night that he was crucified, this is something he said that night. He said, nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is for your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you but if I go I will send him to you this is his promise he says I'm going away but the Holy Spirit is coming and going to do something in you he also said this but the helper the Holy Spirit whom the father will send in my name he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you anybody ever been tutored by the Holy Spirit we have, uh, we have someone that, that has been joining our classes, and one of the things that she said recently was, was, wow, I used to pick up the Bible and I would read it, and it made absolutely no sense to me. She said, but now, you know, I, I, I just sense that God is teaching me as we're reading through this stuff. He's tutoring her, and that's who he is, the Holy Spirit. He's the comforter. He's the tutor. So in the last time Scripture records Jesus coming and hanging out with His disciples just before He flew away before their very eyes. You understand, Jesus just like Superman. He flew out of here. Just before that, this is the last time the Scripture records He came and just hung out with the guys. And it says, on one occasion, while He was eating with them, He gave them this command. Don't leave Jerusalem until wait for the gift my father promised. Remember what I talked about the other day? I want you to remember that. And I want you to wait here for it. Which you've heard me speak about. He said, for John baptized with water. But in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? It's bigger than a nation. And Jesus is like, oh, guys, come on. It's bigger than that. Now it's smaller. It's individual, which makes it bigger. Because all of the individuals worldwide, it's bigger than that. And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. And that word witness there can actually be translated into the, the word martyr into our language. You will be my martyrs. In other words, you'll be willing to die. You'll be strong enough and sturdy enough in your faith in me to die for me. And in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And then he, he flew away. Jesus was the tip of the spear for what was about to happen. And what was about to happen was major. On planet earth, this was about to shake everything. This was God's interaction to not just police the earth, but to turn the hearts of man towards him. And it says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, like, this, like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them wow what an amazing moment that was can you imagine that trying to even to describe that and trying to visualize it they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them all of them were filled with the holy spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the spirit enabled them what did we read about back in Babel? They were separated by language. What was happening here? God was bringing us back together. He was bringing unity to us. He was saying, hey, doesn't matter what language you are. Doesn't matter where you come from. I want you to know when you come into the kingdom of God, you're a part of 
the church. You're part of what I'm doing on this earth together. And it says, now there were saying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. These people wanted to hear from God. And when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these people speaking Galileans? What does that mean? Aren't all these people stupid? They were asking, these people are not educated. There's no way they know another language. Aren't all these people Galileans? How are they saying, how are they speaking in our language? Then how is it that each of us hears our own native language? And then it lists a bunch of different places that these people were from. And, and he says, they say, we're, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? What does this mean? This is miraculous. Some, however, made fun of them and said, ah, they've had too much wine. They're just drunk. Well, Peter stands up and he says, the other 11 were there, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. Ha <laughs> ha. And everybody laughs. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. This was the prophecy. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And look at what he said. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. James David, would you come? Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. There's an old song that I thought would be appropriate. The church is about people getting saved. It's about growing people in a relationship with God and with each other. And it goes all the way back thousands of years. And the church is here to implement God's plan and His purpose in the world. And we are that church. We may be small, but I say to you, you are the tip of the spear in this community. God has us here together for a purpose and a reason. And so let me read the lyrics to this song. And some of this song, they actually speak through it. So it doesn't all rhyme and stuff. I don't want you to get distracted by that. But I just want you to listen to the words. Let the church be the church. Let the people rejoice. For we've settled the question. We've made our choice. Let the anthems ring out, songs of victory swell, for the church triumphant is alive and well. You know, this ship's been through battles before, the storms and the tempests and all the rocks on the shore. Though the hull may be battered inside, it's safe and dry. It's going to carry its cargo to the port in the sky. God has always had a people 
Many a foolish conqueror has made the mistake of thinking that because he had forced the church of Jesus Christ out of sight, he had stilled its voice and snuffed out its life. But God has always had a people. The powerful current of a rushing river is not diminished because it's forced to flow underground. No, the purest water is the stream that bursts crystal clear into the sunlight after it's forced its way through the rock. There have been charlatans who, like Simon the Magician, sought to barter on the open market that power which cannot be bought or sold. But God has always had a people. Men who could not be bought and women who are beyond purchase. God has always had a people. There have always there have been times of affluence and prosperity when the church's message has been nearly diluted into oblivion by those who sought to make it socially attractive, neatly organized, financially profitable. But God has always had a people. Yes, it's been gold-plated, draped in purple, and encrusted with jewels. It's been misrepresented, ridiculed, lauded, and scorned. But God has always had a people. And these followers of Jesus Christ have been, according to the whim of the times, elevated as sacred leaders and martyred as heretics. Yet through it all, there marches on that powerful army of the meek, God's chosen people who cannot be bought, flattered, or still or murdered on through the ages they march the church God's church triumphant listen child of God it's alive discouraged pastor it's the church and it's still alive lonely missionary sow the seed with confidence the church is still alive old saint you're not alone or forgotten the church is still alive it's alive my broken-hearted friend it's still alive busy mothers just keep trusting in Jesus the church is still alive you're not alone out there young people just keep Keep looking to Jesus. The church is still alive. And faithful fathers, there's rest in the Lord. God's church is still alive. So family of God, lift your hands. Lift your hands and praise the Lord. The church, God's church triumphant is alive, my friends. Alive and well. It's alive. He's alive. We are alive with him. Jesus was the tip of the spear. And we are the church that moves into the community and touches people's lives. You are the tip of the spear to penetrate the hearts of humans with Christ he wants to use you there are people that he wants you to touch and encourage this week I was talking to a guy wasn't interested in Jesus just a couple of months ago was going through a hard time But this week, as we talked, I said, man, have you talked to God about that? The spear just penetrated. You could see it on his face. Just enough, God began to do something in his life. And he said, no, I haven't. You know I haven't. And I said, wouldn't today be a good day for you to start talking to him about it? Probably so. Probably so. It's not that hard. Just talk to him. Tell him. Let them know. Jesus is alive and well, and you and I are the church. Wow, it's awesome. Would you bow your heads? So let me ask you a question. Have you been endued with power from on high? 
is God's Holy Spirit in you and upon you. Ask Him for it. Ask Him for that great anointing on your life. Worship Him. Let God come inside of you in a way like never before. God, we thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit. We thank you for your love for us. And God, we ask you for everything that you got today. If you've got a power that would help us to live better for you, to walk with you for the rest of our lives, then Father, we ask you, give it to us. And we know you do. It's not a matter of if. We know you do, based on your word. What the early Christians experienced, and so many between then and now, we want it for us. Your church, that we may be alive and well. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. And we commit ourselves to you as a church family. That God, we will do what you've called us to. To penetrate this community. To reach the lost. And God, to train up your people. To grow people in a relationship with you and with each other. To do what you've called us to. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. And maybe you're here today or you're listening online and you need a new relationship with God. Maybe you never had one. Or maybe you need to renew it. Just do that right now. Jesus, thank you for your forgiveness. Wash me and cleanse me. Help me to do what you've called me to do for the rest of my life. I repent of my sin and I thank you for coming into my life. I want that relationship with you in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Amen.